come from beyond time, from beyond the outer limits of your imagination, and he's ready to blow your mind. Celebrating its 8th year anniversary, PT seems to forever hold a massive chokehold on the gaming community and has influenced countless horror titles since its release back on August 12th, 2014. It's the topic of countless speculation, wonder, and fairy tale esque intrigue in what could have been. Although since it's been so long, some might not remember just what exactly happened to the project that could have been Silent Hills, how Kojima essentially been advertising the game a year prior, and how Guillermo del Toro was super, and I mean super mad, at the game's cancellation. So let's go back, back to 2014, when the game was first shown on Gamescom 2014 through an extremely awkward trailer of people getting jump spooked by the game. It's, uh, it's really underwhelming. Although this shit was trendy back then. You got Markiplier and his funky bunch to thank for that. Also, Dead Space. Seriously, watch this commercial when you can. It's so fucking stupid. I'll show you my opinion. This is, it's, it's gross. I hated it. Yet, as underwhelming as the trailer was, it did get some people interested, but not as much as some of you might think. At the time, PT was speculated to be Kojima's project by only die-hard Kojima fans back then, which was a niche at the time. Nowadays his fame, or infamy, depends on who you ask, has been launched into the stratosphere ever since he was let go by Konami and got his own studio, though we'll talk more about that later on. During this time, Kojima had done a marketing campaign of Metal Gear Solid V, where he disguised footage of the first level of the game as a brand new IP made by a completely fictitious developer named Moby Dick Studios. It was honestly not a very well hidden secret as leaks began to eke out of the project about a week or so after these trailers dropped, but looking back, it probably wasn't supposed to be well hidden in the first place. It just seemed like Kojima wanted to troll around a bit before unveiling to the world his new Metal Gear project. I mean, he even hired an actor to play a fake persona, the Swedish CEO of Moby Dick Studios named Joachim, Joachim Mogren? Whatever, Joachim being an anagram of Kojima and Mogren being a reference to his then rumored project Ogre, which ended up being MGSV. Joaquim even did some amusing interviews with Kojima's boy toy, Jeff Keighley, that clearly poked fun of the thinly veiled secret. Okay, so you're going to prove that this is real. So what, what are we seeing here? This is some, some concept art from, from the game? Yeah. Some concept art. There's the whale, it looks like. Uh, oh, wow, those look like some new screens. Oh, the main character. So these are screenshots. I noticed there's a, a Fox Engine logo in the corner, so this game is running on the Fox Engine. This stunt would later fuel PT's marketing scheme, where once again, a fake studio by the name of 7780's studio was in charge of developing the game, though this time it was a lot more subtle. Though there were very notable clues before the game even started that showed you that this is a Silent Hill project and that it was being worked on by Kojima, namely in Gamescom 2014 when this was live streamed, that the PT trailer was shown immediately after new Metal Gear Solid V footage, which correlates to the fact that this is a Kojima game. And as soon as you start the game, or rather the demo in this case, you'd actually see three circles in reference to the Halo of the Sun symbol that's seen all over Silent Hill games. Nobody really knew just what this was until sometime after the game was published and the streamer by the name of Soapy Warpig accidentally found the solution. It's kind of hard to tell when Soapy Warpig solved it since a lot of the articles don't even mention her being the first person to discover the ending nor do they really mention the day it was discovered so I'm just kind of working off my own memory here and estimation and if my memory and the estimation serves right I think it took about maybe a day or two after PT was released for the ending to accidentally be discovered. 
And it's extra funny because if you actually watch Soapy Warpig's stream, I think she only had like about 10 people watching at the time. So 10 people, including Soapy Warpig, found out that there was a Silent Hill game before the whole world knew. I think we're at the end. Oh, fucking brilliant. Oh, that feels so good. Pumps. Oh my god! Oh my god! Hideo Kojima, what? Oh my gosh, the secret's being revealed. Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my fucking god! Oh my god! Oh my god! It is! It's Silent Hill! Now I say accidentally, because even after the stream went viral, not a lot of people knew just how she solved the last puzzle, which stumped many players weeks, even months after it was revealed PT was a Silent Hill game. We sort of had vague understandings on how it was done, something about baby photos and photo scraps being somewhere, going backwards maybe? Something to do with Midnight, Jareth or Jared, Sarah, Lisa, wait, go to the brightness settings? Huh. Look at that. Does this puzzle even have any relevance? Wait, I have to say what into the mic? Wait, what if my mic doesn't work? <laughs> Seriously, why the fuck does this baby laugh so much? Is that bad or not? How many times should the baby laugh? I don't know, who knows? God damn it, I just wanna see Norman fucking read us. Keep in mind, I'm fully aware that people have cracked the code by now, about a few years later, sure, but I wanted to emphasize how confusing the last puzzle was and really how creative it is. Something only Kojima could come up with, even knowing the puzzle wasn't fully solved until years later. I mean, we kinda knew, but not really. Though it does show how genius it was, or maybe it was just really stupidly obscure. Either way, the content PT had was immense, despite only taking place in one single hallway. The game starts with you in an empty concrete room. There's not too much to do here, so you go outside and the game begins. Right off the bat, the way this game is built and the way the halls are cluttered with trash and filth as well as photos, I mean, the scenery tells a story all of its own and in a very well-crafted way. The trash is carefully placed to illustrate a tumultuous life that once roamed these halls. The host of the radio show tells the story of a man who murdered his wife, coincidentally with a photo of a married couple right next to the radio. Kitchen after lunch. When his 10 year old son came to investigate the commotion, the father shot him too. His six year old daughter had the good sense to hide in the bathroom, but reports suggest he lured her out by telling her it was just a game. The girl was found shot once in the chest from point blank range. The mother, who he shot in the stomach, was pregnant at the time. Police arriving on scene after neighbors called 9 11 found the father in his car listening to the radio. The way the man tells the story is highly unusual and somewhat sensationalized, sort of detaching you from the horrors of what is being told with a voice that more resembles something theatrical than that of someone who's telling the news. It's strange in a way that really can't be described, almost giving a sense of disillusionment. Then after a few cycles through, this ghost appears before you and holy shit, is she scary. This is Lisa the spirit of what many believe to be the main character's wife. She doesn't do much at first, but the lighting when you first encounter her is perfect, and her breathing is terrifying. From here onwards, the game takes a turn and becomes a nightmare-inducing thriller that manipulates the hallway, the bathroom, and at some points, the controller as well. It did many things right, and within a relatively small level, the amount of creativity that oozes from this one hallway in particular is immeasurable, and the amount of scares it can pull off just by working the lighting and the sparing use of Lisa is invigorating. The few times you're allowed to go to the bathroom is also very effective, as while it holds very few valuable things, once in a while this fetus-like creature appears, unveiling more about the story. The whole hallway is symbolism for a cyclical purgatory, a concept where a person replays their sins and faults before they could be accepted to heaven. Taking into account that the main character is trapped here due to what he had done to his wife, it can be assumed that this apparition is his very own demon that he must confront, but it's always eluding him, haunting him. 
watching him, right behind him, and sometimes even killing him, forcing him to repeat the cycle. This isn't the only reference to religion either, as Lisa's own eye is missing, the right eye in particular. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body to be thrown into hell. Matt 529, Mark 947. The murder itself is also very gruesome and seemingly random. A shotgun blast to the stomach? Now why would the husband do that? Well, because Lisa was pregnant and he wanted to get rid of the child. Not because he couldn't handle being a father, but because he couldn't handle the truth. It wasn't his child. It was, as allegedly stated by the fetus, his manager's child. Even the jump scare, the one and only one, is incredibly effective. I'll have you take a look, but if you want to skip, here's the timestamp. I'll give you a moment. Okay, you ready to see it? Here it is. His six-year-old daughter had the good sense to hide in the bathroom. So I love this jump scare so fucking much because it does everything, and I mean everything, so well. First of all, the sound of Lisa's breathing gives you the sense of dread. Your sixth sense kind of kicks in and you just want to run, but you can't go anywhere. Secondly, the game doesn't just play a loud sound to scare you. It actually lets you process that split second that there is a face right in front of you with literally no sound. Only after this complete silence does it play a sound. So it combines the brief realization the average human brain has to react to see the face, but also plays a sound ensuring you realize what you just saw was horrifying. Not only that, but after the jump scare, you hear this disturbing sound. Now, the squelching sounds have been debated for a while, but if we were to guess what exactly that sound would be, well, it it doesn't take much imagination to guess. Most people have assumed that Lisa was performing fellatio on the protagonist, but I personally think it's her, well, it, it's, let's just say it might be her attempting to be a mother again. Or, if you're not into that sort of imagery, um, she's eating cake, I guess. I especially love that you can see Kojima's inspiration for his love of movies in this one tiny demo. References to films such as Jacob's Ladder, Eraserhead, even cultural stuff like War of the Worlds, all of these things and more surmised as one of the greatest video game horror experiences we've ever had, and yet, despite the amount of praise and meteoric hype this game garnered, the project was ultimately axed under Konami's hands. Now what happened? Everyone loved the game, everyone was excited about it, and hell, once it was revealed the combined might of Hideo Kojima, Guillermo del Toro, Norman Reedus, and whoa, Junji Ito too? Yeah, he was also sort of part of this project too. People's expectations just shot instantly to the stratosphere, wondering just what could have happened, and we'll discuss more about that right after this break. Touch that dial. We'll be right back. Hey, look, everyone, I'm a marketable plushie. All throughout Traumathon, the wonderful people over at Makeship will be running a crowdfunding campaign for the Goose Boost plush till Halloween. And once it reaches its goal, it'll be produced immediately after and shipped in early 2023. So now's your chance to do whatever your sick mind has in store for me. Go nuts! Whatever! Just make sure to buy a plush before the end of the month because he will never return! Get yours today on Makeship! Links are in the description below. So picture this, 
Kojima, a mastermind of gaming. Guillermo del Toro, the master of cinema. Junji Ito, the master of horror. All gather one day to have dinner to discuss plans to make one of the greatest Silent Hill games of all time. Ideas are slung, suggestions are made, concepts are worked up, and Norman Reedus, at the height of his career, is now happily part of the project. So where does this all lead? Nowhere. Fucking nowhere. See, this whole project, it was sort of dead on arrival. Kojima was offered to work on the new Silent Hill after showing a ton of interest sometime in 2012, but at the time was working simultaneously on MGSV, a massive game that used up most of Konami's resources. The budget was unlike anything they've worked on before, and Kojima wasn't sure if it was going to all sell, but honestly, it didn't matter to him. His creative freedom was everything he ever wanted, and he was going to make this game his way no matter what. But even then, MGSV arrived in stores incomplete. The last chapters of the game was cut. Many plot points were left unsolved and most of the missions were padded on in order to compensate for the game's length or lack thereof. During his work on MGSV, the Fox engine was simultaneously being handled by several employees of Konami, but even at this point, the Fox engine was not complete. Konami's patience was running thin, and their money wasn't coming back. Kojima was on thin ice, but things got even worse in 2013 when he was eventually demoted from Konami, making it much harder for him to acquire the resources he needed to finish MGSV, and for that matter, start Silent Hills, which he was working on at the same time. You can even find references to PT itself in MGSV via a random radio broadcast. To the radio. Konami at this point was reaching a turning point. You know what I mean. It was being taken over by business execs who believed that mobile games were the future, and so was Pachinko. These people didn't really understand what video games were, nor understand what kind of IPs Konami had. They just sort of believed in not making video games, but rather making programs addicting enough to incentivize gambling and microtransactions. The people who were taking over were no longer gamers, they were businessmen. Some of these guys didn't even know most of, if any, of the Konami characters that existed in their gaming franchises. It didn't matter. Nothing mattered. So long as it made money, it was allowed to exist. Kojima wasn't making money. He was making risks. Risks such as hiring big name actors for his games. Risks such as developing a whole new engine just so he could optimize just a bit more fun from his games. Risks such as meeting with big name directors from Hollywood just so he could spitball ideas. Risks that simply could not exist under Konami's new regime. And so, Konami proceeded to do everything in their power to make Kojima's life miserable, locking him away from his own employees, denying healthcare to Kojima production employees, sending letters to other big name gaming companies that warned them of former Konami employees who wanted new jobs after Kojima left, and a slew of other claims that are currently unverified at this time. This ended with Kojima being fired just two years after his demotion, Silent Hills getting cancelled, and fans understandably being more than just disappointed, but infuriated, especially after all the horrible things that were leaking out of Konami after his departure, some of which was rumored to be coming from Kojima himself. There's even a very well documented video that explains how PT could potentially have been an allegory by Kojima himself that explained how he was going to get fired soon and how most of his identity was going to be erased after this demo released. The video is titled PT's Hidden Meaning and it goes in depth about crazy stuff that was hidden, odd coincidences, hidden messages to the player, and so much more. Seriously, I highly recommend the Great Debates video. It's incredibly well done and oddly compelling. After his firing, Guillermo del Toro was not too pleased either, to say the least. And Junji Ito, well, as cool as it is to think he could have been part of the project, it was ultimately just a thought. The whole Junji Ito thing was kind of overblown as Junji Ito himself talked about the Silent Hills meeting he had, and it was just one. And honestly, it was more of a dinner date than it was a meeting. Still, it's kind of cute to think about, isn't it? Guillermo del Toro, Kojima, and Junji Ito just singing karaoke together? It's kind of wholesome. 
it, this whole situation isn't really that wholesome. In fact, it's downright vile. The potential PT had was astronomical, and many still wonder just what could have happened had Kojima finished what he started, if Junji Ito actually got on board, and if Konami actually gave a shit about games. We do get a couple of glimpses here and there of what could have been. Just recently in 2020, this guy right here found a way to explore the outside of the house where PT takes place, and he was able to freely explore the vast open area of this empty city. The floor, of course, has no collision, so... Oh god! Oh Jesus! Wow! Holy shit, they actually thought that far ahead of people might be, like, escaping the boundaries? Oh wow, that's... That's impressive. Well, anyways, eventually there was a workaround this collision problem, and we were able to explore the world outside Lisa's hallway. And I gotta say, it's really kind of impressive just how far we're able to go. There's a ton of cars here and there. Most of the buildings and windows seem kind of unique. And eventually we can see an overpass, which is surprising because I don't think you can actually see most of those details at all in this trailer. So that leads me to believe that this whole map was a sort of alpha version of what the full map was going to be, a kind of blueprint for the final design of Silent Hill or Silent Hills, whatever it was going to be. And yet, it's sort of funny that even years after the game's first release, PT is still being heavily explored and some of the mysteries are still unsolved. So much of this game is a mystery, from the cryptic messages to the strange atmosphere to even the development itself. Hell, even Guillermo del Toro talked about how it was completely different when he first played it as opposed to the actual build of the game we see now. Even that is question. Just how different was it? How, what could it have looked like? What did he play? Some players have even hacked the game, ripping assets out of the game just to get a modicum of info of what could have been the greatest horror game of all time. And yet, all of these questions will forever remain unsolved. But these questions and more keep getting asked. This is because PT was just that good. It was a game that inspired so many future game developers and imitator after imitator after imitator, released just years after the game's first announcement. Even Resident Evil 7 was claimed to have taken heavy inspiration from PT, especially since their first gameplay trailer was a literal PT clone. Taking place in a small house? Check. Having weird puzzles? Check. Little to no jump scares? Check. Possible paranormal activity? Sure, check. First person despite previous entries never using first person perspectives? Check, 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 motherfucking check. But honestly, nobody ever got mad at these clones. And if you do, I mean, I mean, chill out, seriously. Some of these games are pretty good. In the end, it was a celebration of what could have happened, but never did. We remain here, hoping that someday Kojima will make a horror game, and it doesn't even have to be PT. People just want to see what he can come up with, especially now that he has full creative control over his own studio and games. Whispers have come along here and there of maybe Kojima buying the rights to Silent Hills, maybe making a horror game based off of Death Stranding's universe or just something after Death Stranding. Hell, there was even a recent photo of him having an interview with his child and Jordan Peele, who is now being referred to as the king of cinematic horror by a ton of people. Is that potentially something? I'm not sure. All we can do is wait. Wait and hope that someday Kojima will return to horror.